my wife is out of town. She's in California right now and with, I think, eight other women that all graduated from where she went to Bible school. So they're having kind of a reunion. And uh, she's going to be there till she doesn't get home till tomorrow night at like six o'clock. It's like, wow, that's, uh, I have tremendously missed my wife. The, l- the last time she left, I came into the office one morning and Fallon looked up and she looked at me and says, hey, Pastor Lynn, you, you look great. Renee's out of town or something, huh? Thanks, Val. She said, yeah, I could just tell by the way you were dressed. It's like, oh. You know, my wife, my beautiful, amazing wife, picks my clothes out for me pretty much every day, but especially on Sunday. And then she makes me want... She, she comes in while I'm still studying. Try this. I'll try. I want to see what this looks like. She's gone. She's gone. So that's my disclaimer right here. My wife is out of town. So I called her and said, Renee, uh, what? She said, oh, I picked all your clothes out. Go look on the, on, on the bed. And it's like, oh, oh, Awesome. So I went in there, and she picked my clothes out. But there were three pairs of pants. There was four different shirts with a variety of t-shirts to try and, like, match up. And I said, what do you mean, was I went in there this morning, what do you mean you picked out my clothes? There's way too many choices here still. It's like... And I really thought, you know, in every experience that we have, all of the things that we do, there's something that we can learn. And so, I, I was, I, I was, my dear, I, I can't believe this is way too many choices. And she says, any of them will work. Like, oh, oh. You know, sometimes we're asking God for, for an answer and that we, we want to know an answer. And, and, and a lot of times... He's just saying, yeah, any of those are good answers. It's, I'm okay with any. I'm okay with any of those. Are you with me? You know, sometimes we're looking for a specific word, and he goes, yeah, that's your choice. That's your choice. Any, any, of, them will, any of them will work. So, <clears throat> Pastor Rich, what was that <clears throat> throat clearing about there? <laughs> Okay, let's, I want to revisit just a little bit of, uh, a little bit of last week. I'd like to turn, um, wow, another thing is trying to get used to, to glasses. If I have to read from a distance, I need these things now. If I want to recognize faces, I wear these. If I want to read, I have to take them off. Like, life is rough. Trying to adjust, trying to adjust. So if you'll turn with me to Second Chronicles Seventh chapter, fourteenth verse. God says, If my people who were called by my name, we read this, went through this last week, went through the whole thing, but I just want to really capitalize on this. If my people who were called by my name, that would be us, us Christians, will humble themselves. Humble themselves. We revisit that humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and heal their land. What's the first thing there? It's like humble ourselves, if we will humble ourselves, and we will pray and seek his face. I'm going to revisit that that, that, that face thing again, because, you know, when, when, and then I want to turn to the next place we'll be going is Matthew 6, verses 9 through 11. That's seeking the face of God. You know, I was just thinking back over the years many times that 
when someone, like when I was leading Celebrate Recovery and working with some of the, uh, of the men and women that were struggling with different things that, to overcome from addictions, a, a lot of addiction stuff. And, and when someone had, had tripped or fallen and then they would want to talk to me or have me pray for them and they would have a real difficult time looking me in the eyes, looking at my face because it just made them feel that much more guilty. You know where, I'm, where, we, where we are when it's like when we feel the guilt of what we have done, the Bible tells us there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We love him and we're called to a purpose. So there is no longer condemnation so we should be able to seek his face and look him in the eye. Are you with me? It's like, if my people will humble themselves and turn, it's like, repent. Once we've asked forgiveness, once we've repented, he is such a loving, gracious, like much, much grace, God, that is so ready and willing to forgive us, so we can seek his face and he can look upon us and bless us, like with the numbers blessing. Are you with me? We don't struggle in shame. We turn from our sin, turn from our wicked ways as we humble ourselves in him. The problem is, so oftentimes, is we will come up with some kind of excuse or reason not to humble ourselves, and our hearts then can actually become hardened. When we let the enemy come in and we start to listen to his lies, it separates us further and further to where we feel altogether too guilty to even ask again. But from God's perspective, we know, understand, and believe that when we are forgiven, the slate is wiped completely clean, right? Forgiven and forgotten, slate is wiped clean. So when we come before him again, it's like, God, I am so sorry I messed up again. That is the enemy that's condemning us after Holy Spirit has convicted us. The enemy is condemning us. And God is saying from his perspective, again? Because when the slate was wiped clean, he has forgotten. And when we have stumbled as we're practicing righteousness, but we've stumbled, he's ready to lift us up when we humble ourselves, seek his face, repent for what we've done. He is gracious enough to lift us up, look us in the face and say, I'm so proud of the progress you've made, son. I'm proud of the progress you've made, daughter. Put us on our feet and say, come on, come on. Are you with me? That's the God we serve. He is a loving God. I want to, to turn now to Matthew 6. It's not happening up there, so I'm going to... How about back there? All right. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. That's good. That's as far as I really want to go. We can read the rest of that. It's, it's awesome. It's amazing. But hallowed be his name. What does hallowed mean? It means glorified, that there is glory in his name, that we honor his name, that we hold him in high, high esteem. Oh, because he's faithful, because he's loving, but he's also omnipotent. He is all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing, and that there is a, a requirement that as he is holy, we become holy, as we walk in holiness. Are you still with me? Are we still agreeing? You know, hallowed be his name. The fear of God is the beginning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, an honor, a, a, a fearful 
and honoring fear, where, where we honor, where we revere, where we respect. He is a very respectable and awesome that we look upon him with awe because he is that kind of God. He is a loving, caring, gracious God, but he is the creator of all things. Anything created was created by him. And so we have to honor and we have to respect that. I think, I, I, man, I have so been all over the place studying. It's like uh, familiarity breeds contempt. You know, we can get to a place where we m make God so familiar that it's like, oh, no longer do we, is there reverence and honor and respect because of who he is and what he's capable of. So, and we can just think, you know, those who keep his commandments are those that love him and he will absolutely return that love. Scripture says, what can separate us from the love of God? Not height, not depth, not angels, not demons. Nothing can separate us from his love. But, <laughs> a big caveat in there, but those who love God are those that are obedient to him, that keep his commandments, and he will love them, be with them, he will be in them, and us in him. When, it's like, if you, then I. We say the love of God is unconditional, and that's absolutely true. His love is unconditional towards us. He's for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to save the world. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he cares for us. But those that love him are the ones that he will manifest to, pour his love out on, and he will be in us and us in him. We will be one with him. And we all... On the same page here? This making sense. Okay. Um, yep. Proverbs 9, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, <clears throat> I want to take another... Uh, side road here. The fear of the God is the beginning of all wisdom. Uh, um, he loved us so much that he sacrificed, that he sent his son, that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We're all so familiar with, with that. But I want to go back to, well, in fact, let's go to Hebrews 12.15. Looking careful, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. It's like, if we're not willing to submit ourselves, to humble ourselves before him, and forgive as we have been forgiven, so looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Say, well, how does that fit? You know, I have known several people over the years, and even through there are four or five years of, of Celebrate Recovery that actually became very angry with God, familiar to the point of angry with God because, because he let a loved one die, because he let somebody get sick. Everybody knows somebody like that, either that or everyone's gone through some of this, like, but God, if you were a loving God, would you, could you actually do that? Are you with me? It's getting like really quiet. People are getting up and leaving. That's making me nervous. So 
So when a root of bitterness, or someone can end up with a church hurt, how many people have never been hurt in church? <laughs> you thought I was going to ask, who's Colton? <laughs> well, you bet. <laughs> no, I, it's like, man, there are, the, the, the difficult part about church is it's full of people. And people are going to let us down, disappoint us, and hurt us. And people that are in leadership are even more likely to let us down, disappoint us, or hurt us. It's like, oh, who's getting so excited about that come on stuff? I happen to be in leadership here. I kind of feel insulted by that. No, when we put someone on a pedestal, we're just asking to be let down. So we got to be careful about that, putting people on a pedestal, pastors on a pedestal, or anyone on a pedestal, because we're going to find ourselves let down, we're going to find ourselves offended, maybe even find ourselves hurt. And so many times I've, I've seen and watched this because of a root of bitterness that has sprung up, and a generation or two has been affected because of a mom or a dad that's walked away from a church that's been hurt and left and like, oh my goodness, a root of bitterness springing up and defiling many. We as a church, as Christian believers, as part of the family of God and the family of Valley, have to be so careful to guard our hearts to thicken our skin just a little bit so not only can we be corrected but we can be offended and we can be hurt just a little bit and still get over it. We need to have grace and love one for another so that we can end up standing around in a great big circle holding hands and loving and encouraging, edifying, building one another up not tearing one another down or finding somebody to be on your side because she said this and he said this and he did this to me. Can you believe that? <sighs> That's where that root of bitterness can, 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 begun, can begin. A, a little unforgiveness, a little bitterness, something, an unresolved conflict can let that root start to grow and it can spring up to defile many. It, it, it's amazing when somebody comes to you. I can remember about 17 or 18 years ago when someone would come into the church and say, you know what, the last church that I went to, I'm so glad to be here because the last church that I went to, da 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 da, -da and you know what they did to me, and they did this, and they treated me like that, and I was like, oh, my word. I can't believe somebody would do that, that that actually happened in church. Well, you are in the right place now, sweetheart. <laughs> or bub, or buddy. And I'd shake hands and, and, and then find out within about 18 months, we get to see that root that had grown down in, that was not pulled out, that was not dealt with, would spring up and start to defile the people around the circle that they... So it is so, so, so incredibly important that when we're a part of the body of Christ that we do things right. Whew. Are you with me? It's like, man, we need to have grace towards one another. We need to have love for one another. And we need to... Let's see, I, had a, I had a scripture for that for last week. Philippians 1, 9 through 11, it's like love with wisdom. No, that's the note that I put with it. That we love with wisdom and discernment. We continue to love on people, but with wisdom and discernment. Because we can think that we're being very loving by receiving someone who comes in just complaining, complaining, and complaining. And we're just trying to love on them. And where what we're doing is just letting them spew their bitterness rather than figuring out a way for restitution and reconciliation to another brother or sister. That is a good word right there. <laughs> that we are loving with wisdom and discernment. 
It's like, man, that's like, I, oh, I don't want to hear that. If you have a solution and you need some help with that solution, if you need me to set up a meeting, if you need me to help work through this problem with you, I would love to. If you're looking for a prayer partner, I would love to. If you're looking for somebody to side up with you, you're creating division in this church right now. Yeah? Okay, we need to be pay attention. We need to be attentive. We need to be paying attention. Wisdom, discernment, and love, love, love. Keeping God, the fear of God, the awe of God, the reverence towards God, not making it so familiar. You know, there are... Uh, we have to be careful. Here's something that I, want, I just want to throw out there. This is a teaching moment here. We have to be really careful. Second, you know what God just told me? Holy Spirit just told me. It's like, as soon as you say that, there is, it's an unrefutable word that you just released. If indeed you heard from Holy Spirit out of the mouth of God, then nobody can argue with you. It's like, we got, <laughs> we got to be really careful about that. You know, there are some people, oh, I just heard. It's like, no, what I believe I just heard Holy Spirit say was, which gives us then the opportunity to judge that. In Philippians, it, it says that, or I mean not Philippians, Corinthians, Paul is talking about, you know, a couple of people get up and share prophetic words and the rest judge those words right we've read that so we just have to uh, I mean again putting someone on a pedestal that everything they say and every word that comes out of their mouth the Holy Spirit just told me God just said the Lord said the Lord says it's like wow you are making him so familiar bringing him down to such a level that that's a little bit scary it's, you're scaring me right now so we can't even discuss this because God told you or showed you. It's like, I don't know about that. I've, oh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's like, guard your heart, guard your heart. Guard your heart. And your words, weigh your words carefully before you just say, God said, the Lord said, Holy Spirit said, it's like, careful, careful, careful. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. We're going to go there. Um, I'm going to talk about Jesus now. Yeah, finally. Oh, let's get to the good stuff now. It's like, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That was so good this morning. The worship was like, wow, just powerful. And it comes right into alignment with the, with the word that I'm bringing this morning. And I... I that doesn't surprise me. We get to see that happen a lot, almost all the time. It's like, thank you, Jesus. Well, we're going to go to... Oh, I do want to say one more thing before we get into the really good stuff. First Samuel 15, 23 says, Rebellion is as witchcraft. And some translation, rebellion is... For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king, talking to, to, to Saul. But I think that's something that we also have to be very careful of, is sometimes we, we think, oh, well, I'm just a little rebellious. I got a little rebellion in my heart. Oh, I'm a rebel at heart. It's like yeah that's another one of those things that we have to be careful what we rebel against for sure it's like oh 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 
Much better to come into conformity, (laughs) especially when it's with the Word of God, that we conform, that we submit, that, that we humble ourselves before Him in His mighty presence and according to His Word. Humility and the Word of God, not stubbornness, rebellion, which is witchcraft. This makes sense to anybody? Yes, yes. How easy it is to then turn around, it's like, oh, uh, I'll rebel against that. I don't, I don't receive that. I, it's like, oh, grace, 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 that the words that come out of our mouth are building people up. We're edifying one another. We're encouraging one another. Okay, um, okay, okay, I've said that about three times. I'm going to go to John... We're going to read from uh, 3.16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. How's the world going to be saved? Through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the doorway. He who believes in him, in Jesus, is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth, nobody say the truth, Jesus is the truth, He who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Say, God in us, us in God. Transparency is so important in the kingdom that we're walking in the light. Are you with me? You know, um, and... We talk, there's many scriptures that talk about walk a walk, a walk worthy of his calling. We're walking in the light. And it, it, people are always looking at us. People are always watching us. And it is certainly one thing to be a Christian when we're, we've talked with Chris, Christy Lynn and I, Pastor Christy, we're talking even uh, a little about Saul. When Saul stepped into the presence of the prophets, he prophesied. Two two different times when Saul, King Saul, when he stepped into the presence of the prophets, was hanging out in that atmosphere, he prophesied. It's like it is so easy for us to come into the presence of God, to come into a place like like this and be overwhelmed by his goodness and and feel his presence and, and prophesy and be all godly and worshipy and and all that, and then take off and leave and and then start falling into the other kind of temptation. So we're like walking in the light when we're standing in the light, but slipping back into darkness when we leave the light. Kind of funny, I stepped in the, where, where they were meeting, where the worship team was meeting in there. I stepped in there and Christy goes, oh no, oh no, mom's gone. Dad, do you realize? It's like, yeah, babe. She was looking out for me. It's like, yeah, that was my disclaimer, but I say, it, it's pretty obvious when you're, it's like walking in the light, stepping into darkness. Walking in the light, Stepping back into the darkness, like, okay, we're trying to straddle the fence here now. Light, dark, light, dark. (laughs) 
Yeah, see that giving me choices. I had a hard time there for a little bit this morning, but decisions made. Decisions made. I can strap that right down now. I'm, I'm ready to show everyone I am walking in the light. I choose the light, not the darkness. I'm going to turn back a little bit to chapter 3, verse 3. It says, Jesus talking to Nicodemus in verse 3. And uh, Demas, Nicodemus is asking him a question, and he says, Jesus answered him and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, and it's an interesting conversation. He goes, what am I, going to go back into my mother's womb? It's like, no, no. You know, for something to be born again... That means it has been born one time, born into the flesh, to become flesh, then that has to die to be born again. Right? Has to be passed away to be born again. I think this is the most amazing, amazing thing that Father God did for us. And I I used to... I used to struggle with this, but I kind of got finally my own revelation of that is so simple. I'm probably the last one in the church here to get this, uh, to get this. But I didn't used to really go too deeply here because it was troubling to me when I would think of, uh, well, I lost my son. And that was an incredibly painful, painful thing that I could not imagine choosing to sacrifice my son for anything or for anybody. It's like, that ain't happening. It's like, how, how could that even work? It you know, kind of hurt my heart, my brain to even process that. Like, God, how could you do that and sacrifice your son and, and watch him suffer? It's like... um Let's, in fact, there's a great place to turn to Hebrews 5 8. <laughs> oh, no magic here. Okay, I can find it. I'm getting faster and faster. Although he, Jesus, was a son, Yet he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Although he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. It's like we know that Jesus was the firstborn of many brothers and sisters coming into the kingdom, right? Tells us in Romans, Jesus being the firstborn of many brothers and sisters that are being adopted into the kingdom, to be sons and daughters. It's like, okay, Jesus being the firstborn. Jesus will be our example, our living example. It's the Son of God, Spirit of God, wrapped in flesh. And that he subjected himself to all things that we could, will, might, did, Any human experience of suffering, whether it be anxiety or anything, that he came in as a baby and, again, even subjected himself to time that he had to grow from childhood to adulthood and then be obedient in and through all things and every experience. And it is through that obedience... Through that suffering, which he absolutely learned obedience on our behalf or for our behalf. Does this make sense yet? Am I still? uh... Yeah. Okay. Because God loved us so much, 
He had this plan of salvation for us. I'm going to start over here. He had this plan of salvation for us that no longer would he end up having his back turned to us. As we read in the Old Testament, there was, there was Jacob who wrestled with, with, with God and he said, I saw God face to face. There was Moses who saw the face of God. Most of the rest of them, his back was turned because he was not happy with them. Right? Okay, so most of them, saw only the back of God. I mean, they did not get to see God face to face because, it, I don't have a word for that. I, I really feel like, it's like, man, that doesn't sound like a very loving God. But when I was raising up my sons, they were very active. <laughs> and I was a, uh, I'm basically a first generation Christian. Um, so, my parents ended up coming to church and really coming to the Lord through my experience. Came, it became an experience of their own. But So, uh, I'm a first-generation Christian, I guess, would be the best way to put that. So, what I realized in raising up my sons, I didn't have this expectation of them being perfect. I was kind of thinking about bloodlines and some of the stupid things I did. It's like, well, you reap what you sow. I don't like that, but that's probably a likelihood, even though I'm breaking the chain because I am a Christian that is going to live my life for the Lord. I'm dedicated to that about 52 years ago. I was 19 years old. So, but I was raising up my sons and with a grace and a tolerance factor because I knew all of the things that I did as a kid up till 19. Uh, and then stupid after that, but... Uh, <laughs> so when... But I had a desire that I so wanted my, my boys, my children, to be living for God, to be living right, to not go through the kind of mistakes and the, and the painful things and the running my head into a wall and <clears throat> over and over again. It's like, yeah, you don't have to do that. I'm going to give you some instruction to help you so you don't have to go through all of the things that I went through. And so in that instruction, but when I could see them get a little older and begin to do things, not in my house, because they knew what the rules in my house were, both of my sons, not together collectively, but each of them individually moved out of my house before they turned 18 because they knew the rules in dad's house and they very much decided that that's not the way we want to do it. We want to, and, and so I, I would see some of the things that they were doing, it's just like, oh, man, I don't even like to see that. No, 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 you're not doing that. You know what I mean? It's like it's painful to, to watch your children disappoint you when you want something so much better for them and they choose otherwise it's like oh, I can't even watch that that makes me sick to my stomach and, and it makes me cry it's like oh so sad and I believe that's exactly where God was with the children of Israel and with those that chose other gods before him so he's a jealous God that he expects us to love him, that he would be the number one position. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all the things you need will be added to you if you put him in number one position. Are you with me? And that he is a loving and a caring God, not just somebody that's sitting up there with a hammer ready to bonk you on the head, whack a mole every time you pop up and do something silly. It's like, no, no, he wants you restored. He wants you to do what he's called you to do because he's got a high purpose for your life. That's what he, his desire is for you. And that's why he said, no, don't do that. Do this. Follow me. No, no, follow me. Follow me. And is God ever disappointed? I say, absolutely. Absolutely. He is disappointed when he sees his chosen creation messing up. But 
He's also a God of progress and a God of hope. And, and as Matthew was saying, ever faithful, ever faithful to see us through to completion for what he's called us to do. Okay. So being that kind of father God, he was able to allow his son to go through a tremendous amount of suffering to be able to be the one and done sacrifice for our sin so we don't have to go through all that. Amen. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. We are forgiven. I want to turn now to um, the end of the fifth chapter and the beginning of the sixth chapter of Romans. Teach this for, for baptism and then... With the 19th, 20th verse, 20th verse. Moreover, the law entered that offenses might, the offense might abound. The Old Testament law was brought into force so we would see and understand sin, that sin abounds, right? So that as sin reigned in death, even so, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So one man's mistake, Adam's mistake, we all fell, we were born into sin. And then the law, which made us completely and fully aware of sin, but as sin reigned in death, being the fear of death, even so, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It's like, no, we kicked off the black shoe. We're walking in the light. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Now, what I was just saying a little bit ago, in order to be born again, we have to die. We're baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So when we crucify our flesh, when we submit to God, when we humble ourselves before him and we're ready to turn from our wicked ways and we claim him, <laughs> ask Jesus into our heart and lives to be our, <laughs> our all in all, our savior, our guide, our, our, our comforter, our counselor. We should be walking in newness of life. Resurrected from the dead life we were living. We have crucified our flesh on the cross with Jesus Christ to be resurrected to walk in new empowered life with him. If we've been united together in the likeness of his death. So if we have died with Jesus, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. <clears throat> Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So have you died? Have we died? We died. Let's just say, we died. 
I died. The old man's dead. My flesh is crucified. I walk in newness of life with Jesus Christ. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we're also going to live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. He died for all of us. He made that perfect sacrifice. He, see, see that's the beauty in that the, 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 it's like, wow, Jesus had to do that. He had to go through that so he could become our advocate. It's like I can be talking to you and say, man, I am so, I know what you're going through. And you say, no, you don't. You've never been through that. You don't know what I'm going through if I haven't been through it. But I can tell you this, Jesus has been through it. He suffered. He went through every temptation, all kinds of humiliation, the anxiety to the point that he was sweating blood. How many of us have sweated blood? Become so anxious, so struggling with what we were about to face that we begin to sweat blood. Like, not me. Not me. So Jesus has seen it all, been through it all, and surpassed every temptation, every suffering that mankind and any of us would go through. It's like, you know what? I don't know, but he does. I haven't been there, but he has. I don't necessarily have your answer, but he does. It's like all we have to do is humble ourselves before him. We have to pray, seek his face, so nothing is hidden from him. Repent as we turn from our wicked ways. Be baptized with him. Be resurrected into new life with him. Be empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk out just exactly what he's called us to do. And be blessed along the way. Jesus came, John 10.10, 10, that we would have life and have it to the abundance That's good news. That's good news. Jesus has been there. Jesus done. He has seen. He's been through it. He's conquered death, hell, and the grave for you and for me. We, trusting and believing in him, submitting to his leadership, to his guidance, oh, have a blessed, blessed life. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Sometimes we are brought to obedience through suffering. Doesn't have to, you know, if Jesus had to do it, we may have to too. But, all right. You know, uh, first the last Sunday of, the, of, of 23, we talked about finding ourselves standing on holy ground. What is it that is between us? You know, when he said, you know, take off your sandals, you're standing on holy ground, and, and we all sought Holy Spirit, we sought God, like, show me, show me what it might be that I need to take care of, that I need to get rid of, and we, and we went and we hung those things on the two crosses that were up here. You all remember that. Then they took those and they burned them. It's like, whoa, whoa. first we thought this is something we're going to pray over for all of the people. It's like, no, no, no. These are sacrifices of, from the flesh that was hung on the cross. Anything that came between us and God, and we put those in a pile and we burned them. And I believe that that was taken care of. 
How many of you that are in here this morning were a part of that? Whatever you ended up putting on the cross is something that, you're, that you have felt a deliverance from or a freedom from? Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. He is faithful. He is faithful. Let's stand together. He says that Jesus, having been through everything, having overcome every temptation, being the ultimate overcomer, knows everything, every sickness, anything that we may be going through. And he sits at the right hand of the Father to be your advocate. It's like, and we just thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus for the sacrifice that you made. We thank you for who you are, for all that you have done. We just come before you with such grateful hearts. We love you. We value you. We honor your name, your holy, holy name. And there's nothing we want more today than to be pleasing, that our worship is a pleasing aroma to you, that our actions are a pleasing sight to you. As the deer pants for the water, Lord, my soul longs after you. You are my greatest desire is to serve you, to love you, and to be loved by you. And I pray that for each one in this congregation that as we, as we come together here this morning to worship your holy name, to just to love on you, to minister to you, I just pray that the heavens will be open and receive the sacrifice of the praises of your people today, Lord. And that as we make our requests known to you, that heaven will hear our prayers and that you will hear from heaven and that you will heal your people and heal our land. We love you, we bless you, and we trust you with all that we have and all that we are. And in Jesus' name, amen. Let me get the prayer team come up here. If, there, if you have never asked Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior of your life, man, today is the day of salvation. Because he got something for you today. I would just encourage you to come if you've never asked Jesus to be Lord and Savior. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, with that promised gift of the Holy Spirit, endued with power from on high, if that's what you want this morning and you say, Lord, fill me up. I want to be wrapped up in that power. I want to, I, I want to be endued with power from on high. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Baptize me in your spirit. I just ask you to come right to the front this morning. He's got something really special for you this morning. If that's something that you've never received, baptism of the Holy Spirit, I just ask you to come to the front this morning. If you need healing in your body, if you just need a refreshing and just would love to be prayed for this morning, if you need freedom from anything, I just encourage you to come. We have a prayer team that's ready, willing, prayed up and able. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Again, Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your compassion and your power. And I want to read one more. Now there was uh, the pool of Bethesda. There was a man that for 37 years, I think it was, had been laying, struggling with a, an issue, uh, an ailment. And he had been laying there waiting for the angels to come and stir the water, for them to come and stir the water. 
and Jesus stepped onto the scene and he asked the man, he said, do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered him in verse 7 of chapter 5 of John. The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, and while I'm trying to get there, another one steps down in before me, and he's the one that gets the healing. It's like, I have no man to put me into the pool. It's like, this was highlighted to me. I was like, wow, that's so amazing how we can see, we can come up with so many excuses, like Jesus, Jesus, I'm looking to a man for this. I, I need a man to throw me in that pool. I need a man to bring me in there. But it's like Jesus said, I'm right here. What do you want? I have an answer for you. I got a solution for you right here. What is it that you want? Do you want to be made well? And I just feel like that call is out here this morning. If you want to be made well, it's like, Man, we don't need to think about the excuses, that anything that might be in the way, anything that stands between you. It's like, I believe Jesus is here. He's calling. He's saying, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want your sins to be completely forgiven? Do you want to be filled with my Holy Spirit? And if the answer is yes, you don't need to be waiting on any man. You just need to come. You just need to come. I believe that's an invitation this morning. It's like, come, come, come. So as we worship, the altar is going to be open. There are people that are ready to pray. God bless you and keep you this week. Make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace throughout this week.